Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Are we headed for something worse than a recession, but an outright economic depression? I've got a lot of energy on this topic. Then to provide more insight on the economy's direction in the health crisis, I'm joined by the leader of the oldest economic forecasting firm of its type in all of America today on Get Rich Education. Finally, with Total Control Financial, get checkbook control of your existing 401k and IRA funds to invest in real estate. Yes, you can move your retirement money into your own checking account, but you must avoid the little-known tax that you'll get hammered with in a self-directed IRA. Instead, start your QRP. Learn more and get your free copy of the QRP book by text messaging QRP in all capital letters to 72000. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from Howard Beach in Queens, New York to Howard University in Washington, D.C. and across 188 nations worldwide. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. Look, the coronavirus pandemic is going to continue to be a major deal economically. This is a financial crisis on top of a medical crisis, on top of an oil shock. A recession is imminent and a depression is possible. We're going to unpack that today. You are living through right now what I call the great shutdown. That's what I like to call it. It's not the Great Depression from 1929 and 1939, and it's also not the Great Recession from 2007 to 2009. Some forecasts estimate that the unemployment rate from this current crisis here could hit as high as 20%, and we haven't seen those levels since the Great Depression, and it's particularly devastated service sector and restaurant jobs, as we know. The 1930s Great Recession lasted 10 years. It began after the stock market crash of October 1929, which sent Wall Street into a panic, and it wiped out millions of stock investors. Throughout the 1930s, consumer spending and investment dropped. What that did is, in turn, it would create steep declines in industrial output, which then made employment fall even further as failing companies had to lay off workers. Well, then that further reduced consumer spending, which further made demand for industrial products fall. And it was this decade-long death spiral down, down, down. In fact, the maximum unemployment rate during the Great Depression was 25%. And how bad was it for stocks then? And now, if you haven't heard this before, it can be difficult for you to believe this. The Dow began falling in 1929, and it did not return back to that 1929 level again until 1954. You didn't hear that wrong. It took 25 years for stocks to regain that 1929 level again. 25 years! And I didn't even adjust for inflation there. All right, that was a quick summary of the Great Depression. Now, let's fast forward 80 years in time to a milder event, the Great Recession. It wasn't so much stock speculation here, but rather housing that was at the center of this Great Recession 12, 13 years ago. It was lax mortgage lending standards and what's called the subprime crisis. Subprime basically meant that Qualified loans were given to unqualified borrowers that didn't even have to prove that they had a job or an income. How crazy was that? Now, I told you that in the Great Depression, the unemployment rate hit its worst level at 25%. In this more recent Great Recession, the maximum unemployment rate was 10%. That was in 2009. Now, when this month's jobs report is released in just a few weeks, we'll see what it is now amidst this current event, which I call the Great Shutdown. We'll see what the unemployment rate is. With the release of the next jobs report, Citigroup economists said they expect the unemployment rate to rise above 10%. So that's above the Great Recession level. 
Yes, I would agree that it will be. I think that the unemployment rate is above 10% right now. I think it'll spike substantially higher than that, but that it won't stay there for too long. Now, so that you have some idea of a baseline, the unemployment rate recently bottomed out at about 3.5%, which is super low. In fact, note that if the unemployment rate gets below 4%, the Fed might step in and raise interest rates in order to keep inflation in check. Yeah, so unemployment was, in fact, uncomfortably low for some people, strange as it sounds on the surface. Yeah, employment was actually too high. Yes, comparing economic numbers across these different eras and long timelines gets tricky, just like anything else. The government often changes the way that they calculate these metrics, so we do get some idea here, though. The Great Depression centered on stocks, the Great Recession on housing, the Great Shutdown, which is today, on health. Well, since this current Great Shutdown is a health-related event, then why don't we look at America's last pandemic that was in 1918. Well, what happened then? Well, the recession that lingered off the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic lasted seven months. So that's another reference point of some import here. Now, what is the difference between a recession and a depression anyway? As you already know, because I've discussed it before, a recession is a gradual decline of the economy that occurs for at least six months. A depression, on the other hand, is a serious economic decline that lasts for years. Many economists agree that in a depression, there needs to be a significant decline in GDP and unemployment rates need to rise above 20%. That is a depression. So I've clearly defined that recession depression line for you here. Do I think that we're on the brink of another depression? No, I don't. That would only happen if the virus is untamed. So I'm going to break that down some more here. Now, that is my statement on the general economy. What about housing? Are we on the brink of a housing depression? However, that would be defined. The answer is no, because housing demand exceeds housing supply. But those that demand housing, people still need a capacity to pay for that housing, just demanding it alone isn't enough. They need to pay with their down payment or their monthly mortgage payment or their monthly rent payment. The Fed has shown that they're willing to prop that up and put dollars into consumer hands. Now, if that's slow to happen, even if real estate did lose some capital value, well, loss in asset value, like say a $400,000 property drops down to three hundred seventy-five dollars well, see, that's not a big problem for buy and hold investors but understand that people like flippers and people like developers, they can't lose home values. And right now, wholesalers are saying to flippers and turnkey providers, they're like, so you're still buying, right? I mean, they are asking that question of turnkey providers. Because in this game of musical chairs, flippers and developers, they're the ones that are up on their feet. And they're going to need to be the ones that have a chair to sit down in if the equity music stops playing. But buy and hold investors, you're already seated, but that doesn't mean the chair can't get toppled over either. I've got some good resources here for long-term buy and hold real estate investors. Did you know that affordable insurance is offered to landlords and investors that protects you against tenants that fail to pay the rent? Yes, if the tenant defaults on their payment to you, you can potentially get insured Against that, three resources for that are named Rhino Coverage, Steady Marketplace, and then a third one is Core Home Insurance. They offer policies as well. I'll put those in the show notes for you, which you can access at getricheducation.com slash 288. Let's listen to a collection of President Donald Trump clips for a minute. This is all from back in late February when coronavirus just began its spread into the United States and many didn't understand the gravity of its effect. He sure didn't. He starts by comparing it to the flu. People die from the flu, and this is very unusual. And it is a little bit different, but in some ways it's easier, and in some ways it's a little bit tougher. Uh, But uh, we have it so well under control. I mean, view this the same as the flu. When somebody sneezes, I mean, I try and bail out as much as possible. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle. It will disappear. And from our shores, we've, you know, it could get worse before it gets better. It could maybe go away. We'll see what happens. Nobody really knows. The fact is, 
The greatest experts I've spoken to all. Nobody really knows. We're ordering a lot of supplies. We're ordering a lot of, a uh, lot of elements that, frankly, we wouldn't be ordering unless it was something like this. But we're ordering a lot of different uh, elements of medical. Now the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus, and this is their new hoax. Yeah, quite a bit of nonchalance and even dismissal there. I had posted on my own personal Facebook timeline back in January that coronavirus is going to be a bigger deal than you realize in order to warn friends, and you can still find that post there. We're talking about are we headed for an economic depression here on Get Rich Education, episode 288. That's our topic today. America is growing its debt faster than its GDP. In fact, all this Fed money printing for stimulus packages and more comes at a time when the GDP is simultaneously poised to sink. Well, this worsens our debt-to-GDP ratio on both sides at the same time, and that ratio is basically a measure of a nation's solvency. Look, a doubling, I mean a complete doubling, of the U.S. currency supply over the next year or two is possible. It could double that fast. Now, though quickly doubling the currency supply can lead to a longer-term day of reckoning, one thing it does is it helps prevent deflation. Why would there be any deflation threat in times of high unemployment like we have here in the Great Shutdown? Well, because lack of currency, that means that everyday consumers could hoard currency and pay down debt. Well, that act is deflationary. Why would it be inflation instead? In the near to intermediate term, well, now that all these dollars are being printed, look, no one's producing goods. Well, when you have a big supply of dollars compared to very few goods, what's that do? That naturally drives up prices. You have more dollars than goods. So we're holding back on the supply of goods while the government sends money to stimulate demand. Now, that's what could lead to price increases and then perhaps even government price controls to thwart price gouging. So what's your takeaway here? It is for you to own and control real assets like timber, water, certain types of real estate, and maybe it's even farmland or gold. The more currency units that are created, the smaller the fraction of the real things that they're able to purchase. That's why real assets put you at an advantage. One important thing that the Great Shutdown is showing us here is that bad things really can happen. Look, life's been pretty good in America for a long time, and I think there is this notion of American supremacy or superiority inside a lot of people, and that can lead some people to dangerously think things like, oh, that really bad stuff, that doesn't happen here. Even the world wars are pretty much all fought overseas. America is too proud and too polished for any real disaster. I mean, that's how some people are still predisposed to think. Well, events like 9-11 and the toppling of the World Trade Towers began to change that, and a coronavirus pandemic begins to change that. Suddenly, you begin to see that we really are vulnerable. I think it's a call to action. It makes politicians and constituents alike think, yeah, you know, Our electrical grid really could come under attack. Or, gosh, I guess that North Korean or Iranian missiles headed our way really is a possibility. And then bringing this back around, you know what else it makes you think about? And this is what real estate investors are so beautifully positioned for, a society with monetary hyperinflation. It makes you think that high inflation or hyperinflation really could happen here in the land of the free and the home of the brave. The more smart debt tied to a real asset that you've got, the better off you are. Oh, and it could get even better because you know who the biggest debtor is, the biggest debtor that you know? The biggest debtor you know is the U.S. government. So they want to print and inflate. So just do what you know they're going to do, and there you go. I think President Trump, Though he did handle coronavirus in a slow and embarrassing way, he said something that I really loved when he was recently asked by a reporter after the big stock market fall. 
He was asked, Mr. Trump, did you or your family sell stocks? And Trump gave a great answer this time. He said, I don't have stock. I own things. That's exactly what he said. He's talking about real assets. Now, look, you've got to consider something. How many of these conventional economic metrics like GDP, unemployment rate, market levels, how much does that even matter during a crisis unlike any other? I mean, look around. On the New York versus Boston Yankees Red Sox rivalry, Jonathan Kraft, the son of Robert, president of the New England Patriots and a Red Sox fan, Kraft donated 300,000 masks to New York, to hard hit New York. Nice, bridging the rivalry there. Alcoholic beverage sales are spiking in this crisis. There's a metric for you. So there's more drinking and less working. Hmm, I wonder what that does for a society. You've also got the ongoing debate about how shutting down an economy could help prevent the direct loss of life that could reduce coronavirus deaths. But how shutting down the economy, well, that leads to unemployment and a host of these other societal ills like alcoholism or even suicide. That is a debate for someplace else, although there are some valid questions there. The great shutdown could change your future behavior. Even after this, people might be more reluctant to take lavish trips. There could be more time at home gardening with your family and doing the simple things. You can look at this crisis as either being stuck at home or as being safe at home. It depends on how you see it. But either way, I hope this reinforces the power of now for you. Last year, I did an episode called The Power of Now. Delayed gratification has some redeeming qualities, but if you delay too much gratification in life, you might never be gratified. Now you're at home. So whether you want to get married or coach your son's basketball team or travel to Greenland to see glaciers, do it now or do it right when the crisis is over. Now beats later because sometimes later becomes never. So have a life of oh wells rather than a life of what ifs. Reflect on that power of now. That was episode 252. Something else that this crisis has done is it has exposed our healthcare system. If you're listening outside the United States today, you may not know that America's healthcare system has some big flaws. Care is so expensive that some people that have coronavirus symptoms won't come forward because they're afraid that if they go to the hospital, well, then they're going to end up bankrupt. Well, then they don't go get a checkup and they don't find out that they do have the virus and then they infect other people. So that's why I say this is a crisis on top of a crisis. Next, we're going to talk to the leader of the oldest privately held and continuously operating investment firm in the United States. He's been giving foresight to world audiences for about 40 years. We're going to get his input on what this health crisis means to the economy and what it means to real estate. But first, my heart goes out to the victims and their families. Hopefully, you've probably begun to appreciate the postal delivery worker at your house or that person that mops the floor at the hospital. I've already told you that Mrs. Weinhold, my wife, is a medical worker. I also want to point out that there's someone named Eric that's right on the front lines dealing with COVID-19 patients, patients that need respirators. Eric is a respiratory therapist at a well-known hospital system in Henderson, Nevada. He is face-to-face -face with some patients that are in seriously grave condition, and he is trying to save their life. The death that Eric regularly sees has got to be difficult, and then he has to make sure he doesn't catch the virus or he'll bring it home to his family too. Why am I pointing out Eric? That is because his name is Eric Weinhold. He is my brother. This is Get Rich Education.
This week's guest is the CEO, principal, and chief economist of America's oldest privately held, continuously operating economic research and consulting firm, ITR Economics. In fact, he's been providing actionable economic foresight since 1982, and he's given myriad presentations to distinguished audiences around the world. He also co-authored a book that has that intriguing name, Prosperity in the Age of Decline. Welcome back to Get Rich Education, returning guest, Brian Bolio. Thank you very much, Keith. It's a pleasure to be back. Well, we had you here just a couple months ago, but so much has changed since then. We really had you here before the pandemic even appeared, let alone it being a substantial threat. So we think about some of the greater economic slowdowns over time. We think about the Great Depression from 1929 to 1939, more recently the Great Recession from 2007 to 2009. I've been calling this one the Great Shutdown. I think it'll be less significant than those prior two events that I talked about. I think that this great shutdown is going to be sudden, deep, and brief, but I'd like to get your thoughts. What do you think? Keith, we agree with you. Everything that we're looking at suggests that yeah, this is a very deep, severe, short downturn, yeah. you know, both in the stock market and in the, uh, thinking about the U.S. economy primarily here, it's going to be more of a, a V than anything else. Fundamentals eventually prevail, and you get back onto the trend you otherwise were going to be on. In Europe, it's going to be a different story because they're handling it a different way. But the forecasts are all over the map. If you listen to the broad spectrum of pundits out there, we side with those. And we're not alone that think 2Q this year, maybe 3Q this year, it's pretty much subsided. It doesn't mean that the disease is gone or eradicated, but it means the fatality rate is declining and it's abating as a fear factor. And we're starting to get back into our normal lives. We're obviously in a slowdown. Will we have a strict recession, which is defined as two consecutive quarters of GDP contraction? To me, I don't even know that that matters that much. It's really just more of a, a matter of semantics. Another thing I think about historically, when we talk about how the nation deals with an economic crisis is for better or for worse, long term, we just simply have more what I'll call financial engineering through Fed intervention today to try to pump liquidity to where it's needed. You're absolutely right. We are in an actual recession. This will be two consecutive quarters of decline. And it matters in terms of the history books. It doesn't matter for any of us trying to uh, run our businesses or make money in the real estate market, but it's going to build in the history books as a bona fide recession. One of the things that we're looking at, and you touched upon it, is the sheer size of the Fed's QE5 and how they're working very hard to shore up the credit markets. Yeah. They're much faster to respond this time than they were in 2008, 2009, much more aggressive. You combine that with the fiscal stimulus bill of $2 trillion, which has just about everything for anybody but the oil industry, you're applying some powerful lubricant, not only to the credit markets, which is the Fed's job, but to uh, the consumer and the business community in the form of these loans. When we look back in 2008, 2009, this gets to the brevity point that you were talking about, Keith. When we look at when that round of fiscal and monetary policy came together and how long was it before we saw the economy begin to move up, we're coming to the conclusion that second half of this year starts off slowly, but by the fourth quarter of 2020, it's going to be apparent that we're on the upside of the trend, and this is all passing into our history. And I think part of that might just have to do with when it's forecast that the pandemic, that the virus will peak. But are there any other reasons that lead you to say that in quarter three, begin to see some stabilization and quarter four, some growth? I know that the last time you were here, you talked about how ITR economics has 16 forward looking indicators. Do any of those play into that forecast? They do play into it. We have lost several of the rising leading indicators like the J.P. Morgan Global Purchasing Managers Index has fallen back down into a decline. But three important indicators have not, those three being the ITR all-purpose general leading indicator, that has continued to rise, the ITR consumer activity leading indicator, that's continued to rise, and very importantly, home starts, existing home sales, that continues to uh, be on a positive track. And while it's going to stutter, stall a little bit it is not going to revert back into it. And that's crucially important in terms of seeing some light at the end of this tunnel. 
You mentioned consumer activity increasing as a leading indicator, but clearly we don't have consumer activity leading now or increasing now. Are you talking about what's seen in the future? Yeah, our leading indicator looks out about nine months into the future to tell us what's going on with consumer activity. We consumers' activity is going to look awful through the second quarter. Our leading indicator is helping us look beyond that to anticipate the um, when the advent of the rising trend is going to continue, it is going to reassert itself rather. Got it. That makes more sense. Well, ultimately, economic problems come down to supply versus demand in when we're going to pull up out of this economic slowdown. Now, we mentioned some financial engineering by the Fed before. They pump liquidity into the system. If that liquidity even gets into consumers' hands, and a small part of it is being put directly into consumers' hands, of course, I think that we know as economists, I'm not an economist, you are one, but as economists think about demand versus supply, they know that there's also a function known as capacity to pay there as well. Does increasing the consumer's capacity to pay by issuing them checks help us out with the supply versus demand balance? Because this crisis really is a hit to both supply and demand. Certainly putting funds directly into uh, U.S. consumers' hands is going to be very helpful. Probably as helpful is the buying them some time in terms of making their rent payments, their mortgage payments. Yeah. So, and the assurance on the other side, this that the businesses will be made whole, that matters a, a great deal. We're also looking at a larger uh, supply and demand issue, and that is China's coming back online. China is probably at 90% capacity within the next two weeks, and the boats are on the water, parts, et cetera, are coming over. Europe's got a big drag. Demand in Europe is going to lag behind China's ability to supply Europe. Here in the United States, we're going to have about a two or three weeks supply demand imbalance, and then we expect to largely be uh, redressed, and that'll help life get back to normal. I think that's the thing people want to know most about. When will life get back to normal? No one really knows. You mentioned the fact that China's factories are starting up again. They're getting back on track. I think we know that China, by all outward signs, seem to have a more aggressive shutdown than we've seen here in the United States so far. But that does give us some vision with what's happened in China as to when we might get back to business as normal in the United States. It only looks like they had a more aggressive posture because when they finally went public, it became very aggressive. Initially, it was very slow, very lax, very wide open. I think a better paradigm for all of us to look at is how it has the disease and the reaction has been in Taiwan and South Korea. Those are two economies that have very good statistics. They have a lot in common with the U.S. And unlike Italy, unlike the U.K. and unlike Spain, where the populations are so aged, their populations match up better to the U.S. demographics. And those are the economies and the reactions of the viruses that we're really looking at. And both South Korea and Taiwan are already seeing the tail, the winding down of COVID-19 through their economies. And it's we count the weeks before that, were, and that, that is, is in essence months before we'll see the same thing here in the U.S. That's why when you hear the president say we're likely going to be peaking in terms of our death rates in a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks may be optimistic, but it's based on what we see going on in non-European economies and understanding that our demographics are not necessarily those of Europe. They're more like the economies I just mentioned. Is there anything else that real estate investors should know with regard to this crisis that I've called the great shutdown here with COVID-19? I think this has created some additional buying opportunities. Beyond looking at the short term, think of the long term. This whole thing is going to make businesses reassess their supply chain risks. This whole great shutdown is going to create even more urgency to the nationalism trend that is developing worldwide. And we will have technology, we will have capital, and we will have the means to own this decade, given those trends. This is going to be a fantastic decade to be owning real estate and to be seeing some rise on the end of this that is probably going to get a boost from all this stimulus action, monetary and fiscal. We like what's going on right now in terms of the real estate market, and we're actively wanting to be buyers in this market. 
For the real estate investor, the most important pressing issue in the short term is making sure that tenant goes ahead and pays the rent. There's a headwind there if that tenant has lost their job. But I agree with you. For the long term, there are so many positives for real estate investors here. Now you might have a trend of rather than offshoring production and manufacturing, more onshoring with this nationalism, like you mentioned when you were last here a couple months ago, whereas people want to have better control of their own supply chain for fear that something like this might happen again. And that nationalism is something that's quite inflationary too. It is inflationary, as we talked about those couple of months ago. It leads to inefficiencies. And those inefficiencies lead to some of that inflation. Let me give you another take on this, too. The fantastic quantitative easing that we're seeing go on right now with the Federal Reserve, they're going to have to make a decision in a couple of years if the timeline holds true to what we saw before. Do we sterilize all this fiat currency and all this stimulus or do we not? And I'll be willing to wager, and I am wagering, that uh, they'll clean up some of this stimulus, but they're not going to take it all back because that would be detrimental to the current events out there in 25, 26, 27. And for that reason, I think our overall inflation outlook and therefore the good side of that for real estate investors just got a kick on the upside as you look at the latter half of this decade. It's interesting with all these cash infusions into the economy, it sets more of this precedent of where in this capitalism, if you still want to call it that, we're privatizing gains, but we're socializing losses because we're adding a safety net in. But in this near to intermediate term, I think anyone's going to want that safety net, whether that's a business or an individual. But yeah, the Fed has made multiple cash infusions in the hundreds of billions of dollars into the system. As we know, Congress and the president approved a multi-trillion dollar relief package. Like you mentioned, we're putting those checks of $1,200 and there might be more of those into the hands of everyday consumers. These are all inflationary acts. If you do see that inflation coming, when do you think it will begin to start manifesting itself, Brian? It will likely start manifesting itself in 23, is my guess. We'll be running a slight fever in the second half of 21. But in terms of actionable inflation, it'll probably be more in 23 than it would be in 21 or even 22. Of course, inflation is a positive thing for real estate investors. I like to say that real estate investors win the inflation triple crown when they have a loan on their property and their leverage because inflation increases the asset value. And of course, by value, I really mean the denomination in dollars. It deflates the weight of our debt. And then thirdly, inflation increases our cash flow because rents generally rise at the rate of inflation, but your biggest expense, your principal and interest stays fixed. So due to those three reasons, I like to say that real estate investors win the inflation triple Triple crown. And I absolutely agree with you. And they're going to be especially big winners if they play these the demographics within the states or between the states to their advantage too. In other words, in some states you're going to see a lot more dollars paid out at that triple crown uh, victory party than you're going to see in some <laughs> other states. It's such a strange thing to think about. I never would have believed this growing up. I actually want my dollar to be debased and to be worth less because that's the trend. And we can be profiteers from that when we understand that and we act on that. You're listening to Get Rich Education. I'm talking with ITR Economics Chief Economist, Brian Bolio. We're going to come back and talk about the direction of interest rates and how important will housing be as a component of the economy. This is Get Rich Education. Property investors can get killed with maintenance costs. That's less likely when you buy brand new construction. Let me tell you about JWB Real Estate Capital in bustling Jacksonville, Florida. They pioneered the build to rent model where you can invest in new construction, turnkey rental property. That's why JWB was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. To learn more and see inventory, start now at newconstructionturnkey.com. The company that's provided our listeners with more loans than anyone is Ridge Lending Group, NMLS 42056. You can finance more than 10 single families up to fourplexes. Serving most U.S. states, their knowledge and experience leads to your financial freedom. They're number one in the investment space. Pre-qualify and then chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. Start on your next investment property loan right now at RidgeLendingGroup.com. Hi, Marty, back in there. 
This is author Jim Rickards. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Brian Bolio. He is the CEO, principal, and chief economist of America's oldest privately held and continuously operating economic research and consulting firm, ITR Economics. Brian, let's talk about the future direction of interest rates with the health crisis that's been introduced into the economy. The Fed is going to be following, we think, the global bond market's lead, and interest rates are going to stay depressed through most of 2020. You'll start hearing some more chatter, we think, once we round the bend on it or going through the third quarter of 2020. But between now and then, there isn't much in the way of global upside pressure on these interest rates. So much like we thought even before this crisis was introduced, we thought that interest rates would stay low for quite a while and that easy monetary policy would be there. And this recent event hasn't changed that. No, it's just brought the interest rates down lower, but you're absolutely right. It hasn't changed that. One note, and this gets glossed over a lot of times, is despite everything going wrong, if you will, in March, uh, and interest rates dropping like they have, and indeed some days the 30-day T-bill has gone into negative territory yeah. intraday trading. We have maintained a normal yield curve through this period, and that's incredibly important in terms of seeing that this isn't the end of everything. This The bond market isn't building into this a complete and utter disaster. They're seeing this as a trial, if you will, but uh, we are going to get through this and there is rise on the other side. And I never find it to be worthwhile betting against the bond market. That's really interesting that you brought up the fact that the inverted yield curve is no more and an inverted yield curve is that potential harbinger of problems down the road. Right. And it's gone. So, I mean, it's not instantaneous. You don't go from a normalized yield curve back into uh, ascent, but it is one of those powerful signals that investors, particularly real estate investors, should be keying in on. I've never heard any economist firmly predict that we will have negative interest rates in any significant form in the United States. I just wanted to get your input on that. And we've had economists here in the past, like Richard Duncan and Jim Rickards, have told us why negative interest rates don't work. They don't seem to have worked in Japan for any reason. What do you think the prospects are of negative interest rates in the United States in a substantial form that the consumer can embrace with? I don't think uh, we will ever see negative interest rates here in the United States that the consumer will ever uh, be able to take advantage of. We're not seeing anything sustainable in that direction. We're not Switzerland. We're not other economies like Switzerland where we have a fundamentally uh, sound fiscal program in place at the federal level. And for that reason, during periods of fear, sheer fear, we're going to get very low 10-year bond yields, but we're always going to be above those of the fiscally responsible countries. And incredibly, that includes some of the countries in Europe that were not previously credible in terms of their fiscal policies, but they've gotten it squared away good enough to convince the uh, world bond market anyways. And they look at the United States and they look at what we're doing to our debt and they shake their heads and we're never going to see those negative interest rates as a result. Negative interest rates just seem to be more of a headline generating topic of interest than they do any sort of reality. So just talking overall about housing and thinking about housing, do you see its importance in the economy over the next decade as changing substantially due to this event? And what do you think about housing's importance as a part of the economy over the next decade? We think housing is going to be a very important part of the economy over the rest of this decade. Population is growing. It is shifting in terms of where we're living. It's going to be one of the dynamic factors, a growth component of our economy. Does that make it any different than it has been in the past? Well, not over the long run. It waxes and wanes. It's cyclical like uh, everything else. Assuming we don't do anything to hurt it politically, don't do anything to hurt it. This is, we think, a pathway to a lot of upside, a lot of focus and a lot of investment opportunities still. We continue to like urban areas more than suburban or prairie land. We continue to like on the water. We continue to like with views. Those are our go-to places because that's where fundamentally you're going to find the least supply versus the forthcoming demand. And uh, those are good places to be. Then nothing's changed in that respect. 
Yeah, when we talk about housing and real estate, it is so fractured and it is segmented into so many different markets in a number of different ways. Here, generally, since we're cash flow investors, we often avoid those volatile coastal markets because we're somewhat less interested in capital appreciation. And we're more interested in those stable inland markets that tend to have a high ratio of rent income to purchase price. And there are just so many ways to slice housing markets. I think one way we can think about it is the housing shortage, especially in those entry level homes, oftentimes that make the best investment properties. And a lot of that need still hasn't been absorbed with construction in the housing market. So do you continue to see that low supply as being one of those important supply demand factors for real estate? Oh, absolutely. And it depends on the localized market, as you were saying, Keith. But you go to the Texplex, for instance, there's still a, a need for more inventory for work or grade B housing, affordable housing. Tremendous need and great cash flow coming from that. I'm not sure I'd want to do the same thing in Chicago or parts of West Virginia, but you go where the demographics are strong. You go to greater Atlanta, you're going to have uh, tremendous opportunities for that sort of upside activity and positive cash flow. I think you're going to get capital appreciation and the positive cash flow at the same time in those unique opportunities. People need an affordable place to live. Nothing's changed that. A virus certainly hasn't changed that need. In a sense, you know, at least here in the near term, Brian, it's been interesting. I've talked to a number of property managers and investors across the United States, and we can fracture the housing market into apartments and communal living versus single family homes. And apartments, they share common hallways and common doorknobs and railings and apartment dwellers share the same laundry room. And that's really made some apartment dwellers quite skittish with the virus. And you can imagine how that's worse if the apartment dweller has children or someone has a pre-existing condition. So with a lot of the property managers that I've talked to, there has been good demand for renting single family homes. What are your thoughts? So that makes sense. You know, I hadn't even thought about that snotty nose kid putting his hands all over the doorknob <laughs> in the apartment. But thanks for putting that in my head. That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're not spending too much time in an apartment these days. <laughs> oh, no, not going there. But that's very valid. And even if it's multiplex, it, that it, you have your own entryway even. An apartment building is one thing. Multifamily dwelling units where there are duplexes or multiplex or quads or something, even that's going to be priced differently and be more attractive than your typical traditional apartment building will be. Yeah. Kind of any last or any final thoughts about anything that perhaps I should have asked you about but didn't think about, Brian, whether that's the larger economy's direction or interest rates or inflation or housing or anything else? You know, I think you really hit the topics very well, Keith. One I would throw out there that isn't particularly related to real estate investing is our listeners should expect the stock market is going to come back and it's going to come back strong and it's going to come back quick. Don't try and time the stock market. And I think it's equally foolish to try and time the real estate market. You look for the good locations, you look for the good opportunities, you get close to late in the second quarter or sometime in the third quarter, it might get a little bit crowded. So don't be afraid to make your move if you know what the cash flow numbers ultimately look like. Go for it. Well, that's good guidance. And with the stock market, I often think of that as a leading indicator. People place their bets, if you want to call it those, based on what they anticipate happening, whereas something like the GDP or a lot of these other things are lagging indicators. Well, the GDP would be the quintessential coincident indicator. Lagging would be like non-residential construction. That's a lagging indicator. And now the stock market, it tends to lead, but it's not a reliable leading indicator. Sometimes it actually lags through troughs and it lags through highs. It can be driven by more emotion than fundamentals. And at those times, it tends to go a little bit out of whack. Right. The irrational side of human beings is often manifested in yes. how much the stock market changes. Well, Brian, you've been a really good go-to resource for economic research for decades there at ITR. If someone wants to get involved and check out your forecast, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, thanks, Keith. Thank you very much for the compliment. And I want to twist that just a little bit. We realize this is a very difficult, scary time for a lot of people. So 
we want to put out a free offer, actually. We think it's vitally important you follow the leading indicators that you listen to a non-emotional voice. Uh, we're a group of economists. We're just driven by numbers. I, I don't think I have any emotions, really. So follow the leading indicators with us by sending a text to TR space trial, T-R-I-A-L. Text that to 33777. And for 90 days, you can follow the leading indicators with us. That'll get us through the bulk of the second quarter. And hopefully we expect we're going to start seeing some of these leading indicators flip up. And as they do, your confidence in the sun shining again on the other side of this is going to go up considerably. That could be a great way to get an unemotional perspective for you, the listener. Brian Bolio, it's been great having you back on the show. Thank you very much, Keith. Summarizing Brian Bolio here, I'd say he's pretty optimistic. He expects that we'll have a V-shaped recovery in the U.S. He says that we are in a recession. We will have two consecutive quarters of contraction. The second quarter or third quarter is when the fear abates. And then the fourth quarter is when we're really on the upside. He says that it's going to be a fantastic decade to own real estate. This onshoring that I brought up, that being the opposite of offshoring, means that more manufacturing jobs will be coming here. That's the long-term hope. He thinks that substantial inflation appears in the year 2023 and sees nothing on the horizon to push up interest rates substantially. In fact, shorter-term bonds had negative yields for a little while, negative interest rates for just a touch, but he says we won't see negative rates in the U.S. at the consumer level, like you taking out a mortgage loan or a car loan at a negative rate. That won't happen. Finally, Brian thinks that the stock market will bounce back quick and strong. They were Brian's takeaways, and I agree with so many of them. I'm just not quite sure about the V shape, and I hope he's right, and I'm wrong here, but post-crisis, I don't see us getting back to where we were here too quickly. What I think is that the economy has fallen off a cliff. It's made a brief, steep, quick fall down, and there is a trampoline at the bottom of the cliff. But when you bounce back up off a trampoline, you don't come back up quite as high as the ledge that you jumped from. That's just the law of physics. It won't come back up as high because many of the restaurants and businesses that laid people off are going out of business, just gone. And employee skills are going to change. And it's going to take some time to match up talent with productive labor again. Maybe we'll recover to something like 6% or 8% unemployment and still have a somewhat decent economy. Who knows? Brian might even agree with me on that. We agreed on most everything. You know, one idea I've got that I haven't heard anyone else talk about, I think another stimulus could come for infrastructure projects. That could quickly pull us out of the recession. Congress has been pretty happily writing checks to put people to work lately. An infrastructure improvement, that's something that we needed more of before the crisis. Fixing our roads and our crumbling bridges, that could be just what America needs right now. And then you'd want to look to own real estate near those big public works projects. Think about all the local economic activity that a new bridge or a new highway interchange or an expanded port would bring to an area. If you want more forward-looking economic insight from Brian and ITR Economics, again, you can text these eight characters, TR space trial to 33777 and follow their leading indicators for 90 days. Suppliers are holding back on the supply of goods while the government sends you money to stimulate demand. If demand exceeds supply, prices must increase. Real estate investors win that inflation triple crown. Inflation helps increase your asset value, helps decrease your debt value, and it increases your cash flow in excess of the rate of inflation. That's exactly why, ideally, we want a real asset with a loan and a cash flow stream here in the great shutdown. Today, I hope it's not just an aberration, but you're already hearing more discussion on what signals are going to trigger everyone returning back to work again. And that way, hopefully I can be part of your commute again, and hopefully you soon won't be listening to this in pajamas for a change. Steve Forbes said, everyone is a disciplined long-term investor until 
the market goes down. Uh, yeah, pretty wise words there. Economies are complex. No one really knows the future. Three long-term upsides for housing are number one, housing is undersupplied. Number two, mortgage rates are at rock bottom. And number three, inflationary pressures are forming. Because no one knows when the pandemic will really end and no one can predict the future direction of markets, well then you know what? Smart investors don't focus on predictions, they focus on principles, exactly like those three that I just gave you. Though I don't really know and things keep changing fast, here's the bottom line today. Are we in a recession? Yes, that's likely. Are we headed for a depression? No, that's unlikely. You know, this is a really important episode for understanding your economic future and those of your friends and family. So I love it when I see that you're sharing the episode through word of mouth or perhaps taking a screenshot of this episode and sharing it on your Facebook or your Instagram or your Twitter or your LinkedIn. If you've got friends and family members that would benefit from this information in this episode today and they don't know how to listen to podcasts, well, then just ask them to download the free Get Rich Education phone app. Everyone knows how to do that. Until next week, when I'm back to help you build your wealth, I'm Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.